line up over here. And as I said, keep the questions short and keep them Hello? The problem is I can't turn this on. He has to do it through a test. He's asleep. Is this one working? Nope. Ah, now he came running back. <laughs> okay. Okay, yes, good. So, yeah, the question. I'm really young from uh, Asian in the UK. I was talking about the use of the word um, parasite. Are there sort of else sort of technical reasons for it? Or is it to just piss off the religious people? Does it also apply to things like uh, materialism, racism, and shopping, or things like that? Well, the use of the word parasite, I think, is, is, is not just to piss off some people. I mean, it, it probably also helps. But, <laughs> but originally, it was, I mean, this is really how you can see it, right? You have ideas floating around out there. And they coexist very, very well with your cognitive apparatus. And they sort of, they take it over, right? because they actually, they take over your way of thinking. So you can, I think it's, it's very valid to call it a cognitive parasite. Um, and I, I don't think that you can say that all ideas are cognitive parasite because the basis of that is of course that it must be very, very natural for your brain to take on ideas like that. I don't know that racism is a very natural idea. You could say that the idea of being apprehensive about strangers is, of course, a very natural idea. That's another way that our brain works. We are apprehensive about strangers. But saying that racism is a cognitive parasite, I wouldn't go that far, no. Um, I just had a question. We were talking about how the way to find it is to keep going out and speaking out. And it's kind of easy to speak out against the kind of fundamentalist religions because they're strong. Mm. But the, the sort of fuzzy stuff can be a lot more difficult to see out. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions how to argue against the whole, well, it's just my opinion, you know, and it's just my spirituality, it's just a fuzzy thing, how to seek out against something like that. Mm -hmm. That's of course it, it, it is it is more difficult, and that's why it's it's so successful right now. Um, but I think, for example, in relation to bioethic uh, bioethical debates, it's necessary to always, you know, keep saying, but why should it be why should it be that somebody with a religiously based argument has any place in this kind of debate? Let's hear from the biologist, what are we talking about? And if you want to argue against something like synthetic biology or whatever it is, you can argue against, you know, there might be dangers in using different kind of organisms, putting them out into the natural environment, whatever. But just don't, you know, recognize these uh, religiously based arguments. And, you know, go against it. Uh, go against, for example, the um, tendency of the media to always call in clergy and, and religious groups and ask them, so what do you think about the latest in, in medical technology? We, don't, we shouldn't care what they think about it w with their religiously based arguments. So it, it's, it's always a matter of just speaking up. center at the um, University of Southern Denmark, where I got my PhD way back, by the way. And um, they are looking into this connection between religion and health. And, and one of the, the prime movers in that is, of course, you know, a Catholic guy who believes in miracles, who's written a book about miracles. And anyway, so they're looking into this area of study. And they are finding um, 
some evidence that even in, in this kind of society, if you take, say, people from the Pentecostal movement uh, and, and other movements like that, you will see that they are definitely happier and they live longer and, and so on. I wonder if they have ever, I don't think they've done any studies where they just compare these groups to, for example, the, you know, the fuzzier groups that just will say that they are spiritual and believe in something or whatever it is. Um, but that would be interesting to do. And um, yeah, and, and in, in any case, I just don't think that, it, I think the, the real danger is in that whole wellness thing is that, that you, the underlying connotation is that you are simply a better person if you live longer, if you're happier, and you know, if you don't get cardiovascular disease and cost money in the system. And therefore, having some kind of belief is, is, is good. I hate that. I want, you know, I want the right to have cardiovascular disease and die early if I want to. <laughs> Hello. Uh, one common trait for many religions seems to be the concept of doomsday or the apocalypse. Uh, one one example is in the New Age uh, circles these days. It's a widespread belief that the world will actually end in 2012. So it's the first So we'll all die early. It seems to be that the more fundamentalist or uh, authoritarian the particular religious group, the more imminent the end of the world will be. Hmm. Uh, how would you analyze that from the theory of uh, the brain as a social? Well, it could be, for example, that if you are in a group that um, stands out by having um, very a religion that believes in, you know, that your group is very good and everybody else is, you know, very bad, and and that's typical of those sectarian groups, then you would, you know, you wouldn't mind seeing doomsday as soon as possible in your lifetime because you would be, you know, you would be going to heaven, getting your virgins or whatever it is you get there, and the others would be punished. So I think the more secluded you, or the more different you, you feel from the rest of society, the more you would like to see them punished. And I think that could be an explanation of, of that tendency. Good morning, uh, my name is Jordan from Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I have so many questions, I'll say it uh, The first one is uh, basically building on this, the idea of the parasite and the idea of a certain date of the apocalypse. I was sitting in a taxi in New York, and the taxi driver was convinced that exactly 365 days, the world was going to end. Needless to say, I think it's going to be very disappointed next year. The point is, what does this affect when, when it comes to May 1st, uh, 2011, and nothing happens? How does the parasite of the brain like react? How, do the, how does it justify the lack of an apocalypse, the lack of uh, a vindication of his beliefs? Hmm. Well, the funny thing is, of course, that, that you know, nothing really uh, cures these people. You could see uh, a number of years ago, I stayed in New York for a while, and at that time, there was a rabbi uh, who was actually, he was dying, and, and it was a very strange situation because that particular rabbi, for uh, a lot of ultra-Orthodox Jews, he was believed to be the Messiah. So why on earth would he die? That didn't really fit with, with anything. And so he died, and nothing really came of it. It wasn't that, you know, uh, that they stopped believing in, in their weird uh, interpretation of, of their religion. It, it's just that, you know, people go on. They find some kind of ad hoc explanation. Oh, so maybe God, you know, just thought because of something somebody did, let's not, you know, create the apocalypse in 2012, or maybe we read something wrong in our book or whatever, you create an explanation because you, you want your belief to go on. I mean, it's very, another thing is that if you really believe something, it's very, very painful to leave it. It's, it's very, very difficult. So again, your wonderful brain can create all kinds of weird explanations for why things should still go on as they are. And the second quick question is, I'm just to put it in a historical context. You mentioned in the 1800s that folks said that life begins at conception. 
then I believe that we added the birth control in the 60s and 70s. The Pope then sort of rearranged and said, life is sacred beforehand. You know, masturbation is bad, you shouldn't use condoms and stuff mm. like that. So it seems like religious sort of has a sliding scale. And I want to make sure I got this right that the idea of uh, life being sacred in conception came actually before life being sacred even earlier than conception, or if that's a misunderstanding on my part. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at Judaism, for example, which is, you know, uh, what came before Christianity, the life isn't sacred until, I think it's, it's, you know, when the woman actually feels that there is life. So the fetus is, is quite big at that time. And, you know, it's, it, it wasn't like that in Christianity up until some Pope, Benedict, whatever, uh, you know, made a decree that life was actually sacred from conception because they had at that time uh, a problem uh, with you know, abortions being made. And they didn't want that. They didn't want their congregation to diminish. They wanted more Catholics. So they basically just decreed that. And it just came into being. And because the pope is infallible, you know, what he says is the truth. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, the people with bunch of religions, do you think they are much low? know that they're wrong, or that wrong that the you know, belief is not completely you know, in line with the science and so on. My second part of the question is, do you think the first religions will eventually return to the fundamentalist religions as well, or will they always keep it down forever? Mm. Um, I think, of course, anyone who believes in any kind of fuzzy stuff will, will know that, yes, this is not in line with science. But we, you know, you've never been able to convince anybody who believes in any kind of, of supernatural idea by you know, citing uh, papers from PNAS or whatever. It doesn't work that way. They don't care. It, they will always say something like, um, well, you know, science can give us you know, answers to a lot of everyday questions, and they can give us new mobile phones and this stuff, but they can't answer the very big questions like, why are we here? Where are we going? Well, nothing can answer those questions. But it feels better to believe in something. And it's, for many people, it's, it's, it just it feels unnatural for them to not believe that there is something else than you know, what we can see and touch and measure. And that, again, is, I think, <laughs> tells us something about how well adapted this parasite really is. And then your second question was, you can just reiterate it quickly. I was just wondering if you believe that um, these fuzzy religions eventually will turn into fundamentalism. Um, no, I'm not sure they will, uh, because it's very, I mean, it's so evident from the world situation now that fundamentalism is really not a very good thing. Um, so I don't think we're going to see that kind of reversion. Uh, but I do think that this fussy thing will you know, morph into all kinds of strange uh, appearances that we, we can't really know at this moment what they're going to be. But just look at, for example, look at the corporate world, how you, know, you see these ideas of spirituality have, uh, gaining a foothold there. And, and I think we could see a flourishing of, of you know, supernatural, religious-like ideas in the corporate world, and that we should be very much on, on guard, because the corporate world is really a very important part of the world. They you know, rule us as much as politicians do.